Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you're viewing, and you might even be viewing on the archive or you might be joining us live today. I'm Lisa Nydick, and I'm the U.S. Director for Apps Events. We've got a great lineup for you today. Um, and uh, we've got a great lineup for you today. We're going to be talking about back to school with Chrome and Chromebooks. Uh, and you know, I actually, I want to start off um, before I introduce all of our speakers for today. Uh, I want to go ahead and um, just talk briefly. Actually, I'll introduce our speakers first. So um, today with us, we have our uh, CEO and Director of Apps Events, Dan Taylor. We've got Brianna Charles, uh, who's a tech facilitator with Milburn Township Public Schools in New Jersey. We've got Jennifer Cronk, who's a professional developer and teacher in New York State. And Joe McClung, who is an assistant superintendent in Arkansas, right? Arkansas, yes. Um, so I'm going to give everyone a chance to introduce themselves. But first, I'm going to ask Dan to say a couple of words about Education Plus and Apps Events. Leon, would you go ahead and unmute for us? You think I would have learned this by now after like two years of doing these things, but uh, it every time. Guys, a huge welcome to this. It's going to be a really great session. I'm not presenting, so I'm going to be following along with the rest of you. Really quickly, um, Apps Events, we're, we're putting on these free summits, and we are a partner for Google, for Google Workspace Education Plus. Now, you probably all know that Google Workspace is free. It's always going to be free, all the amazing features. But there's a lot of premium features that are available in Google Workspace. There's lots of stuff for Google Meet. You know, for example, you can record Meets, a lot more security tools. Um, also on Classroom, there's Classroom add-ons um, where you can put a bunch of third-party uh, add-ons and, and embed them in. That's coming this month. Uh, there's also the ability to link your Classroom, Google Classroom with your MIS and SIS. So that really turns Google Classroom into a full learning management system, plus tons of security. Features. I'm not sure if anyone on the call is using this, but it's it's really a great uh, a great upgrade. So if you're interested to check it out, uh, you can do a free two month trial with Google. We can organize it. Uh, just see the link on the screen, appsevents.com forward slash workspace. You can have it free. Use it at your school for two months. Try all the features. If you're not interested, it will just end. If you are, we can help you get signed up. So thanks, Lisa. And otherwise, welcome to the to the summit. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate you talking about that a little bit. I know Brianna and I both have access to uh, Education Plus. Jen and Joe, do you guys have this in your schools? Do not, as of right now. Uh, well, you may want to do that two-month free trial, Joe. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was taking notes for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know, you know, how we would live without it. All right, Dan, thanks for stopping by. And thanks, guys. We'll have a great session. Chat. Yep. So um, Education Plus, I know, has been invaluable in the district that I'm currently working in full time. Um, we use uh, all the features of Google Meet and who knows what's going to happen with COVID, if we're going to be going hybrid or remote again. But I'm, I'm glad that we have that safety net to fall back on. And I'm, I'm loving the Meet quality tool. It has been so useful throughout this last year. Um, all right, so I wanna talk a little bit about Chromebooks and um, I'm gonna invite Jen and, and Brianna and Joe to talk about their favorite features as well. But uh, Google announced that uh, there are 40 new devices available, 40 new Chromebook devices available for this coming school year. And I know the folks out there probably have purchased some of these already for their schools. There's also 500 new policies in the admin console. So I am so happy not to be <laughs> somebody who is deploying these 500 new policies. But the one that, you know, just floats right up to the top, of course, is zero touch enrollment to be able to purchase those Chromebooks when you're going one to one or doing a refresh and not to actually have to touch them to do it. And I thought it was easy before, but it's it's even easier now. Um, Apps Events is sponsored by Acer. So I just wanted to put out there some of the newer models. Um, the Acer Chromebook 317, I mean, come on, a 17.3 inch display. Um, I don't know what Chromebooks you guys have in your districts, but our district, my district, the, it, it's pretty small. I think it's 11 inches. Brianna, does that sound about right? 
Yeah, it's definitely smaller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I can't imagine having access to that 17.3 inch screen, but I guess a lot of the districts that are replacing teacher devices with Chromebooks, that this is a really good option. I know, I don't know about you guys, but I'm on and off with the reading glasses. Like I like a nice big monitor, right? And then of course, Wi-Fi 6. So this is super exciting. You know, Wi-Fi 6 is three times faster than what most of us have right now. So super excited about that now. Um, and then the Acer 514, uh, it's got the built-in camera shutter. Uh, which is great. Like I know a lot of teachers put that little piece of tape there or whatever. And, and there are times that I would love to have that built in shutter. And then I love this, the embedded fingerprint reader located there right next to the keyboard. Imagine, you know, like I've got, I also have a MacBook Pro, right? Imagine being able to use your fingerprint to log into your Chromebook. And, and we'll talk about using that pin access uh, much later during our time together. Um, do any of you have any, you know, Chromebook features, whether it's a new Chromebook or an old Chromebook that like you just can't imagine living without right now? I would have to say one of the features, I think, especially for the younger friends, which we're going to get into a little bit, is the touch screen. I think that having that ability to be able to just use your finger, write, draw, do whatever you need to do is just very user friendly for our younger friends. And I know after you know using Chromebooks the past couple of years and using Macs prior, though I am you know an Apple person, I love my Mac, I think for Chromebooks for students at the younger age level has been life changing with that touch screen capability. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a touchscreen Chromebook here. I've got one of the older Pixel books and um, I, I love it. It's it's actually out of all of my devices, it's my favorite device because I can fold it. It's got that spin just like the Acer in the picture here. And um, I can use it as a tablet. I can walk down the hall with it and be jotting down notes with my stylus. It's it's perfect. I can't do that on my MacBook. I can't write with a stylus. It's <laughs> um, Jen, Joe, anything? Yeah, just to kind of piggyback off of both of you and Brianna, in uh, one of my districts, we had the Acer Spin 11s, and our largest use of that came from using uh, the stylus and the Gorilla Glass. Our, our science and math teachers were able to just fly with that particular device because the, sensitiv the sensitivity of the screen itself, along with the stylus, just made it very highly functional. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. I'm, I'm glad that you hear that have the Acers as well as quality devices. Um, Joe, I feel bad. Like, well, You're you good. have Chromebooks, you just don't have Education Plus. So. Right, exactly. Yeah, we do have Chromebooks, and I'll speak from a different angle as well. So from my end, I'm, I'm usually on the administration side of it. Um, so just the ease of access as far as making sure that our kids are connected and staying connected, especially in this past year and a half through the pandemic. Um, you know, it's just been the, the biggest benefit for me as far as Chromebooks go. It's easy to, to, to be able to know that we our students have what they need whenever they're on site or if they have to pivot to digital learning so that make sure they're taken care of. Yeah, that's great. And and I have to tell you this last year, um, my favorite thing about the Chromebook is that a student can walk into my office because they're having an issue with the device, even if they ran out of battery and I have no chargers left to loan out and I can just hand them another one <laughs> like, and leave. They have to leave something as collateral, but I'll hand them another one and they can go on with their day knowing that they have access to everything that they need for their school day. And, and there's nothing like that portability and flexibility of the device for sure. Um, so speaking of Acer, Acer is Apps Events premier summit sponsor. We do two hour virtual summits like this every month and our we decided that august should be our theme for back to school um but you can check out our youtube channel and i'll, I'll give the channel later today or maybe dan can um put it in the chat for everyone um but it's got the archive of all of our free summits that we've done and we love our presenters that they come and they do this with us um, and and um, dedicate some of their time um, feel free to go out on social media today or any day and use Acer for education or add Acer underscore education send them a little tweet that you saw their devices and you liked them um, 
Couple more quick devices because there are six brandy new ones out there from Acer. Uh, the Acer Spin 713, 18 more percent more vertical space. So just, you know, it, um, you're not losing any screen. It goes all the way out to the edges, which is awesome. And of course, the latest Thunderbolt 4. The enterprise version comes with Google Education Plus already unlocked. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Um, now, for those of you in the chat, you can go to gsummit.link slash Acer, and you can um, fill out the information there, and you'll win a free boot camp or summit ticket from Apps Events. Now, right now, starting actually 10 minutes ago, we had a level one boot camp going on, a level two boot camp going on, and we'll be launching dates in se for September pretty soon. So if, you, if you're thinking about getting certified level one, level two for Google, um, go ahead and fill out that form so that you can win a, a free registration. And um, I think, yep, so this is the Enterprise, the SPIN 713. It's a smaller um, screen, better for students, you know, fits in those backpacks and everything, but you still have that um, vertical screen space because the screen goes all the way out to the edges. Thunderbolt 4, Wi-Fi 6. I mean, these devices are awesome. Um, and then finally, we've got the 14-inch non-glare screen, the Acer Chromebook 314, um, a really great webcam, um, and just, you know, really just a great device. Um, I encourage you all get social and share. Apps Events uses the hashtag Google PD and also hashtag Apps Events. And I wanna just stop for a minute and I want to ask our speakers just to take a moment, um, tell us who you are, um, how you use technology in your role at your school or district or organization, and then um, just give us a little elevator picture of what you're going to be presenting today. So we'll go in order. Um, Jen, if you don't mind, uh, you're going first today. So give Hi, us a little. Everybody. Hi, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Jennifer Kronk. I'm a professional developer and I'm a teacher. And I've also been a director of technology. And my specialty, one of them is assistive technology. And the Chromebook has provided so many different avenues for us to allow our students to access the curriculum and their instruction in ways that are best going to suit their needs. So I'll just be doing some highlights of the assistive technology tools under accessibility on the Chromebooks and I'm hoping to show you something new. Thanks, Jen. And I, um, we've all experienced technical issues before, right? So I'm going to be uh, Jen's wingman, <laughs> and I'm going to add my Chromebook to the stream, and she's going to get to tell me what to do for 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, Brianna, if you go ahead and, and um, take a turn. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, for having me as well. My name is Brianna Charles. I am currently a technology facilitator in the Milburn Township Public Schools, which is in New Jersey. Um, I specify um, specifically with preschool through fourth grade students, so that younger elementary. And, you know, we've been doing this for the past couple of years. We use Chromebooks all the time in my district, starting as early as crazy enough as preschool. So for today, um, in the 20 minute section, I'm going to be focusing on Book Creator and Seesaw, which are two educational technology platforms that we use in our district. I've used them as early, uh, like I said, as preschool, and they are very user friendly for our little friends. There is a lot to it. And, um, you know, they are sometimes you can go with the paid subscription, but everything today is going to be just focusing on, um, you know, how you can use it, just starting off with the free subscription. And then if your district decides to go further, but otherwise um, they are both awesome tools and I'm really excited to be able to share them with everyone. Thanks, Brianna. I'm always excited to see what you're doing with the little ones, me working with the high school students for the most part. <laughs> um, awesome. And Joe. Yeah, so my name is Joe McClung. I serve as the assistant superintendent for Farmington School District located in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, previous to this role, this is my first year in this role, I, I've been a building level principal for a junior high grades seven through nine. Um, so where I'm coming from is, is, is from the support role. Um, a lot of times I, I'm stepping in providing professional development or just supports or, or whatever our, stu our teachers need in order to help best support our students. Uh, so with that in mind today for my presentation, I'll be going over some productivity tools using extensions 
extensions in Chrome. So I'll be sharing with you some of the, uh, some of the highlights of things that, that are my favorites to use in extensions and ways that can possibly help you streamline your, your everyday workflow. Awesome. I'm excited to learn a few new things today. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and I'm Lisa Nyduck. I run uh, the U.S. operations for Apps Events. Um, I produce professional development. I talk to districts and help do uh, some strategic planning on what that might look like, professional development over the next year, two, three. Um, and then I arrange for presenters to present to uh, staff and leadership virtually, or we actually have some face-to-face, -face, or I should say mask to mask events coming up early in September. Um, on my uh, spare time, I am a high school technology facilitator, or some people call that a technology coach. Um, I work shoulder to shoulder and elbow to elbow uh, with teachers in classrooms with their students, helping um, successfully and appropriately integrating technology. Um, so we're running a couple of minutes early, but that's okay. I can keep track of time. <laughs> um, so Brianna and Joe, I'm going to remove you from the stream. And Jennifer, you and I are going to work on uh, Chromebook accessibility together. So um, Joe and Brianna, we'll see you in a little while. All right, so uh, Jen, I'm gonna go ahead and move over to my Chromebook and you tell me what to do and I am happy to help. Thank you so much and uh, thank yous for everybody in the chat saying hi, it's so nice to be here. So the first thing that I'm going to ask Lisa to do is I'm going to ask her to go to settings and one of the ways that we can go to settings is by going to all apps and locating that under your apps menu. So Lisa is going to look for all of her apps or you can even search for it. There's so many different ways that you can find where you need to go and you'll see that settings is right there. And once Lisa clicks on settings, we're going to go on the left hand menu uh, down to advanced and we're going to look for accessibility. And you'll see accessibility is going to have the accessibility person. It's the second from the last. And you can see that Lisa is very smart, of course. She already has her accessibility toggle turned on. And what that does is it makes it visible, these tools visible in the system tray, which is on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. So if I ask Lisa to go down to where you see the time, you'll see that's our little system tray there. And you can see that accessibility option is there. This just makes it much more, um, for lack of a better term, accessible and easier for students to navigate those menus, making sure it's there. And I just like to point out that we put these tools there as a toolkit for our students. And some students will have things in their individual education plan that requires these things, but it's also wonderful to just make these tools accessible for students so they can find the best ways they can learn. It's really a UDL concept. So the first thing that I want to highlight, and we're not doing a deep dive, we're just going into some of the basics here, is Chromevox. Now, many people are not going to be using Chromevox right away. What this is, is a screen reader, not to be confused with text-to-speech. So Chromevox, when Lisa turns it on, will actually wind up uh, highlighting different areas of the screen and reading the screen. So you can see that that little orange square has already popped up above the word accessibility. You'll see that navigate around the screen and read. It's not something that most people are going to use, but as she moves around, you'll see that it'll read the screen to the individual. Now, this is most often going to be used with blind people who are using a refreshable braille keyboard or people that have low vision that need the extra added support. Um, to have the screen read to them. Again, it's not a common one that you're going to use. It's more of a low incidence disability assistance. So we'll leave the Chrome box turned off. But one of the things that you'll probably find most valuable is going to be select to speech or speak. Sorry. And if we open up those settings. Jen, do you want me to, I hadn't added the audio of my Chromebook, but you want me to add the audio? Oh, if you could. That would be great. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry about that. Let's Thank see. You. And and I see we have somebody from Malaysia joining us. Thank you so much for joining us and Norway. Wonderful to see you guys here. Thank you. 
And so once Lisa adds the speech, you should be able to hear select to speak. I'm trying to figure out how not to do this. Or we could just leave it off and I can talk it through. I'm going to try it. I'm just going to try it a, a different way. Okay. Um, no. I'm sorry. I can't have two devices with the audio, even if I muted on one. Sorry. All right, I'll talk it through. It's not a big deal. Okay. And again, I have so appreciate Lisa being my wing woman because uh, my, my particular device that I was going to demonstrate on uh, was not working for me. Okay. So what Select to Speak does is when I click on a line, and you can actually expand these, these tools. So when you click on a line, Select to Speak will actually read that to the student. So this is really, really helpful for students that have um, uh, text-to-voice uh, support in their IEP or directions read. This is also really great for um, any type of language learners. One of the things that I really appreciate that, if we can go back to those settings, Lisa. And we're gonna to go to the select to speak. And we might actually have to go to advanced settings. So here, guys, we're going to the advanced settings. So here's uh, here we have enable select to speak. And I'm gonna ask Lisa to go to uh, text to speech settings. And one of the great things about this is that students get to choose their rate, which is the speed at which that's being read to them, the pitch, and also the volume. And when you go down to preview, you'll also see that there's a number of voices. So if Lisa clicks on where it says English Chrome uh, there, you'll see that I think there's eight selections for English. It's really important, just like the concepts of AAC, uh, where students are using a communication device that our students also get a chance to choose the voice that is being read to them or they're using to read for them. So it's very, very helpful to let students have some time just to toy around with what voice do they like to listen to? What is the rate of speech that they're going to use? And is there any other personalization that they would like to use with that? And then moving on from select to speech, I would love to go to um, our dictation. There we go. And dictation, I'm just gonna talk about dictation because we won't be able to hear it. But when you enable dictation, you press continue, you should get a little microphone option you could see at the bottom of Lisa's tray. This wonderful feature allows me to dictate in any text field. So if I wanted to be able to speak in a website or a Google search, I could use dictation just by clicking on that and then speak. Is, is it okay if I go ahead and do it? Go ahead. I am dictating. I am, oh, it's not. Do I have to press and hold, Jen? You shouldn't have to. So but, I am dictating sorry. into my Google Doc. And we might just be experiencing a delay because we're streaming at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, most likely. Now also in accessibility in Google Documents, we have the voice typing feature. One of the things I like about this feature though is this works in like a Google search. So if you have a student that has poor um, fine motor articulation in their hands, this makes it a little bit easier for them to do Google searches, to enter in uh, information into a text field. Whereas if I was in a Google document, most likely I would just either go to uh, tools and select um, voice typing from there. And another option for adding text to a document and it's interesting because I'm seeing a delay there too. So, um, cause, <laughs> okay. I love it when it uses text speech, you know, and it's like, wait a minute, who was the last person to use this device? 
because sometimes it picks up on that. So again, so the dictation feature, I find it most useful when students are doing Google searches, when they're filling out text forms on a website. That's when I really like to use that particular one. Uh, when we move forward and we take a look at some visual assistance, so we have high contrast mode. Now, high contrast mode is really, really helpful. Thank And what Lisa's doing, what I did not tell her to do, is she's turning on and off each one of the tools. So she's doing cleanup for me because I'm not telling her to turn them off. By the end of the session, we'd have all the tools turned on. So thank you, Lisa. I find that that causes a problem if, if they're all turned on. And whenever I'm demoing it or having students use these tools, I say just activate the ones that you actually need, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you so much for that. So high contrast mode is designed for uh, students that have low vision or poor visual acuity. So you'll see that it has now simplified in a lot of ways uh, the types of, of, of visual input that students can have. The text is clear. There's a higher contrast to it. Um, and in some cases, this can be a real game changer for students. And as Lisa navigates around, you'll see how it looks different. So here, it's it, when you think about, there we go. Thank you. When you think about how we read on white background and black text, it's actually not uh, the most accessible for students in many ways. And it could be a, a large eye strain. I find that a lot of kids like to just turn on high contrast mode because they think it's cool or they just prefer to read that way. But it is designed for students that have uh, low vision to help assist them. Uh, one of the things, since we're talking low vision, even though it's completely different, we're not probably not going to have a chance to talk about uh, this in the tool setting. And we could toggle this one off, Lisa, please. Is also along with low vision, there are supports for low hearing as well. And uh, we're not going to demonstrate this one, but just to quickly speak of it, uh, about this, when the Chromebook displays sound, it's like stereo sound, which means that you will often get different sounds for uh, each earbud that you might have in. You can turn on mono sound, which plays all sounds in both earpieces. So that way a student that has low hearing is not going to miss something. And that's really important because stereo sound sometimes will further disable a student that has low hearing. Um, so we have high contrast mode. Let's talk about screen magnification. There is a lot of there's a lot of things in screen magnification that you could do, and I have my own particular preferences. So we have a full screen magnification mode, and we have a docked screen mag magnification mode. I'm going to ask Lisa to turn on both, and she just automatically just zoomed in too. So there's a hotkey combination that is it Control Alt and Arrow, Lisa, or Trackpad? Uh, control Alt. Control Alt and Trackpad and trackpad. So dragging your trackpad up and dragging your trackpad back. Now, one of the problems that I find out, again, this is a toolbox that you offer your students. So I would suggest that you spend a day with your students playing around with some of the visual features and then spend a day with your students playing around with the magnification settings. My, in my experience with some of my students, they, did, they were not a fan of the zooming in feature because it winds up restricting the total screen. So it makes navigation more tricky. The ones that I found uh, my students most liked was actually the docked magnifier. So they had a small field that was magnified, but they could see the entire screen as well. So they didn't lose where they are. So let's try turning that on and just demonstrate that really quick. So Lisa's going to accessibility. And you'll see that she has her full screen magnifier turned on. So that was when she was able to do uh, control alt and drag, the two finger drag up and down her trackpad or around to be able to see your screen. Now we're gonna go to the docked net magnifier. So in the docked magnifier, you're gonna see that Lisa has the very top part of her screen as she's scrolling around the bottom part, you'll see it's zooming in. So right now she goes to the Google search just go to the Google search, how to change where you were before. Oh, there we go. So as she's moving her mouse around, you'll see the top partition of her screen is actually zoomed in. So the students that I've worked with really prefer this because they don't lose where they are on the website. 
And sometimes the screen magnification actually extends the screen beyond the confines of the screen. So that way students I found have had a little bit of difficulty, but this one tends to be a favorite with my students. But again, this is all about offering options to our students to see which ones are going to work best for them. And um, perhaps after this, I have a quick shortcut list of all these different uh, options that are available that we can also possibly throw in the chat or I could just pass on to Lisa. Jen, I have to admit that I never use this feature. I always use the full screen, especially when I'm demonstrating things, I'm teaching, I'm zooming in and out. Do you know off the top of your head, what is the keyboard shortcut to toggle this off? Or is there a way to rearrange what's on my screen? I've never tried to rearrange the screen. Let me see if I have the keyboard shortcut in my document here. Let's see, do, 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 do. I don't have it right here, but I bet you there is one. I just never use the keyboard shortcut with this. I've always just go ahead and turn it on. Usually, guys, whenever you when you look at the um, when you look at the Google support site for accessibility, there's also always uh, hotkey combinations that are available for almost everything that we're doing. But it would be a really interesting feature to be able to swap screens or adjust where your magnif magnification part is. But that was just, it's funny, that's the one that all my students that have used it, they've preferred over the larger screen one. Yeah, I'll have to ask some of my students for yeah. sure. Yeah, and it's funny because the one that you were doing, Lisa, is the one that I also do on a Mac. Yeah. So I'm so accustomed to doing that on a Mac that I naturally do that, but I found my students got lost. So it's, it's very interesting. But the other thing that I really like is um, the feature of the stylus on a touchscreen keyboard, because then you can use the magnifier on the stylus and really like click right on the screen where you want everybody's attention to come to you, or if the student needs to focus on that part. And that's that's the benefit of the one of the great benefits of the touchscreen. That's also really really beneficial, uh, especially this past year when we're a ton of us were using Google Hangouts. Yeah. And we had to zoom in that way. It's, it's perfect to direct attention that way. Absolutely. Now, uh, we already did our dictation, our screen. Let's take a look. We have now our on screen keyboard. And, and we can go back to uh, uh, the automatic clicks, but I like the on screen keyboard a lot too. So, on the on screen keyboard, you'll see at the below where Lisa has to turn it on. We have a few options for the on-screen keyboard. Now, the on-screen keyboard is designed to be helpful for students that might have limited mobility in their hands where keyboarding might be an issue. But I also really like the feature of the on-screen keyboard. And Lisa, feel free to chime in on this one too. Um, I really like the, the writing option on this. So if Lisa scrolls over, and you'll see right now as she's typing, you have, you have, uh, autocomplete in a way, it's a predictive text actually that is coming up. Whereas a student begins to type, the predictive text will pop up and students can then select words that uh, they're looking to type. It's just a way of helping to conserve time and energy. The more efficient we can make our students when they're using something like this, the more apt that they are to sustain their energy and continue using that. Thanksgiving is a yummy holiday. Lisa, you're making me hungry. And you're also making me sad thinking about the fall. We're in <laughs> August. I want, to, I want to stay summer. Stay summer. Now, let's also take a moment to just also show the handwriting option. Because, again, if you're using a stylus, this is a pretty sweet option to use. So as Lisa clicks the handwriting option, you'll see that we have a wonderfully smart uh, option now where Lisa can actually start to handwrite something. And you'll see that it is typing. So Lisa wrote her name and it has predicted that she is typing the word Lisa. Are you going to say Lisa was here? You totally are going to say Lisa was here. <laughs> now this is, uh, think about, um, there's a lot of studies that have led to um, the thought process that as students are writing orthographically, that they're retaining knowledge um, more concretely than they are if they're just typing. So this also helps students who are not able to either type or prefer to jot notes. This is, um, thank you for the word retain. This helps students retain that information, 
but also helps them to quickly gather that information. Again, if you have one of those flip acers or a Chromebook that's similar to that, where you can just turn around and start jotting down notes, this is a fantastic option for you, as well as for students who are just, it's just not physically efficient for them to be using the keyboard. And I actually didn't have my stylus handy, so I just used my finger to write. There you go. So that is another uh, fantastic option. And of course, we have the voice top, uh, uh, the voice typing option as well, which we already demonstrated. Oh, you don't want me to demonstrate it, but yet I just did. <laughs> but of course, it's being slow for us. And we also you know, obviously, that maybe this keyboard is really obtrusive and it's really big, and we want to have a smaller version of this this keyboard. Well, then we can just go ahead and choose that middle option, which is going to dock it off to the bottom corner and we still have all the same options that we did before and you can move it around by just grabbing the move handle into whatever area is going to make the most sense for you so again all of these tools are highly customizable for your students um, and it, students can decide when and where to use them and in what ways it's going to make life easier for them and we can go ahead and, and talk about the mouse clicks and i think that'll probably be my time um, switch access is very highly personalized, and that's really for students who are using Switch, uh, switch uh, to navigate uh, the actual device. So this is definitely low incidence disabilities, and switches can be anything that a student can manipulate. It could be a head button behind them off to the side. It could be something that they're using, a joystick in their hands. So again, very low incidence. Most likely you're not going to have a lot of students that are going to be using that. Uh, so additional settings. Now we have the large accessibility cursor which if you have students that have a hard time seeing the mouse, this is yet one more thing that we can do. And also as a teacher, when we're teaching, this also helps uh, students track the cursor a lot easier than those tiny little mice that we had before. So you can see that as when you're going to select something just like normal, it'll go into a hand. Otherwise, it's going to be either an eye beam or it's going to be an arrow. And you also can change the color of your mouse as well. Um, again, under accessibility and under mouse click. So if there's something that you think that would be easier for a student to track, uh, let's see, it's highlight mouse cursor. Is that? No, it's not. Oh, I think it's an advanced, isn't it? I, it is probably an advanced, but I do want to talk about sticky keys. Okay. So sticky keys is another option. Again, when we're dealing with mobility, um, for students, if they want to use a hotkey combination, like um, uh, let's say uh, control C or to, to copy something. Some students don't have the mobility to be able to just do control C. What sticky keys will do is it will, the first tap will consider that held down and they can do the second tap and that will actually do the combination for them. And it also, as Lisa will see what she's doing, is she's actually doing the sticky keys right now on her side, although we don't see it right away because we're not on her mouse. So do you want to describe what you're doing, Lisa? Well, I'm holding down the control button and I'm continuing to, to press the key, but it's still working for me. Good. And that was that was my little timer, Lisa. Oh, it's okay. Let's finish up. You have, you have okay. two minutes. <laughs> okay, great. One of the other things that I also like about um, the mouse cursor is how you can change the way you view it. Let's see. So you see highlight mouse cursor. There we go. So that is also yet another way. So let's say the accessibility mouse is a little too obtrusive. Um, or a little too distracting. When you move your mouse around, that highlight mouse cursor will track and just highlight where that mouse is. Again, it's to help students with their tracking when it comes to the cursor. Mm -hmm. And highlight the text caret is the same issue. So we have the mouse cursor where Lisa is moving around the mouse cursor. But let's say a student is typing on, and she's being so good about turning off the options and turning on the options. I'm never good like that. So as Lisa clicks down, highlight the text cursor should show up a little highlight. Well, I switched to, I'm sorry, Jen. Oh, that's okay. Go ahead. Just I switched to um, 
we did the highlight mouse cursor, so I switched to text. Highlight chart. text chart. Thank you. Should do you want me to disable it? No, you could you could you could turn it on if you want. So highlighting the text carrot will just show where it is in. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be working on my device yeah, right now. Yeah. Usually what will happen, everybody, is that it will highlight the carrot. So mm -hmm. the insertion point or the text carrot sometimes can very easily get lost in text for students. And that is just one other cue that students can use to find out where they are. I really appreciated this refresher. You know, you don't when you don't use things, you forget about them or you lose them. And so again, these are the highlights, everybody. As you see, there are so many. It's worth taking time with your students to go into the accessibility settings and just choosing one setting on a day and letting students explore how that works. Students will choose things that are going to help them learn best, and it's about providing them with a toolkit on what's going to be uh, the, the most effective in helping them to access the curriculum and, and all the content that you have to give them. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jen. And, and I appreciate actually following along because it really was a great refresher for me. Um, we'll see you again at the Demo Slam um, in, I guess, in about an hour. All right. Thanks, Jen. We'll see you real soon. <laughs> All right, let's welcome back Brianna. Brianna, I am going to add your screen and um, I'll just go ahead and mute, but I'll stick around in case um, you need any assistance or anything like that. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I know I introduced myself before, but just to recap, um, my name is Brianna Charles and I'm a technology facilitator in the Millburn Township Public Schools. So right now I am specifying in preschool through fourth grade, but I do actually have middle school and high school experience as well. And um, just recently received my master's in ed tech. So I wanted to focus today on two different educational technology tools that I use with our little friends in the younger elementary level. And they also work very, very well on the Chromebooks, which is why I'm focusing on these two for today. And I know I only have 20 minutes, so I'm just gonna kind of briefly go through some examples, just show everyone what it looks like on both the student ends and the teacher ends. And then obviously, if anyone has questions down the line, um, I do have you know, my email and stuff and slides that I will be um, sharing out a little bit later. And I'm not obviously going off the slides because I do wanna spend just time going through the examples live. So I'm going to focus first on Book Creator. Book Creator is a tool, like I said, um, I've used at the elementary level multiple times, actually as early as the kindergarten with using the Chromebooks. So um, just a little uh, recap on what Book Creator is. If you've never heard of it before, students and teachers can create and publish their own books online. Um, students of all age levels can use it. So although I am focusing on, um, you know, elementary, I do know a handful of teachers that have used it at the middle school and high school level as well, depending on what your subject and content area is. And teachers can create libraries for students. Students can create, you know, their own books. They can use um, with the Chromebook, you know, use the touchscreen capabilities. They can take pictures. They can add text and videos and all this audio features, which is really great to be, you know, using on the Chromebooks. And um, students can also be able to, you know, share their books with their friends and other students along with their families as well. So there's a ton of different ways to use Book Creator using the Chromebooks. I've seen it used um, with digital portfolios. Um, there's like step-by-step -step instruction guides, science reports, comics, just creating their own stories. And like I said, I will be getting into some of those examples now. So what I did was in my district, since I don't have my own classroom, I work with all different classes and grade levels. I decided to highlight a few of the different examples that I really liked um, and wanted to you know, show you some different ways that we use it in our district and how um, the Chromebooks have been such a huge help with these two different tools. So this is an ex a second grade example. Students in second grade create fractured fairy tales. So they learn about fairy tales and they kind of create their own spin-off fairy tale. So for this example, um, this is just kind of like a basic example, but you can see here that there's text on the page, there's image, and the student was able to use their finger on the touchscreen to write their name. 
So just kind of going page by page, we're not going to read the whole story right now, but you can kind of see that book creator, you can pick different, <clears throat> excuse me, different backgrounds. You can add images. And then you'll notice that on these pages too, there's the little sound option, which students are able to record their own voice, reading their story right th directly through book creator and the Chromebook, you know, ability in order the sound on the Chromebook honestly is great quality. They're able to, you know, click through easily and be able to, you know, present their stories. So just so you can see, like I said, we're not going to listen to the whole story, but once, um, you know, a student does publish their book and you go to click on the little sound option. Once upon a tide in the deepest part of the ocean, there lived a girl. So you can see that the student is going through their stories and obviously beforehand they wrote their stories. Um, they type them on a Google Doc using the Chromebook and stuff, and then we're able to to um, share them through Book Creator. So just kind of going through page by page, you can see that there's images, there's that, um, you know, the sound option, and then those background options as well. So closing out of that, um, we can see here that this is another example. So for this example here, students in also in second grade do like a living museum where they pick a historical figure and they do research and they're able to, you know, compile all that information. And the teachers have the students use Book Creator in order to, um, you know, create their story. So this is just an um, example I wanted to highlight. It's Susan B. Anthony, a second grader. So they put their text on there. They put their, you know, images and their audio. And it's just really a great way to display their work in a fun way. The students absolutely love it. Like I said, it's very user friendly on the Chromebooks. And um, it's just a fun way instead of, you know, like handwriting a story, like what I used to do, you know, growing up, they're actually able to use their own devices. And to be honest, I, so, you know, when COVID happened a couple years ago, in the middle of the school year, the second grade teachers came to me and were like, you know, Brianna, would it be okay still if we taught the students how to use Book Creator? They haven't used it yet the school year with everything going on. And we were still able to teach them on the computer, online, not in person. They were able to pick it up one, two, three. It was, um, you know, these kids, they are just able to, to learn very quickly with this kind of stuff. But it was just a great way to, um, you know, do something fun, especially in that virtual setting. And then just another example here, this is a fourth grade unit on vertebrates and invertebrates and different animals. So this um, particular group of students, you know, did vertebrates and with birds. So they put like little speech blurbs here you can see and different like shades and colors and backgrounds. So it's just, um, like I said, a really awesome tool that I, I really highly recommend for not just the elementary, but for middle school and high school as well. So just so you can kind of see here, I'm going to actually switch gears. I'm going to show you now, I mentioned this before, but just to kind of recap, um, the two tools, so Book Creator and Seesaw, that I'm going to be getting into in the last 10 minutes of my section do have free versions, but they also have the paid subscription as well. So although, um, you know, my district, I am fortunate enough to have both of these paid subscriptions, everything I'm going over today in the short amount of time I have is going to be, you know, applicable for the free version. So I would highly recommend if any of this interests you and you feel like you can use this in your classroom, which I'm hoping you can, I can see so many different uses for it. You know, start off with the free version, give it some time, experiment with your students, you know, trial it out. And then if if you really love it, which I'm sure you will, then you can obviously, you know, go back to your districts and and see if they have any, um, you know, availability to buy the subscriptions, which do have some pluses. So um, there is an information on the websites and stuff like that on what the differences are. But everything, like I said, I'm going over today is with that free version. So just from the teacher ends, it's pretty much very similar to the student end. the teacher end, you would have to create a new library, right? So I'm just going to do just for quickly modeling purposes. I'm just going to do like a test library here um, on the Chromebooks because, you know, the Chromebooks have that ability in Book Creator that they, students can actually, and I'll show you this in a second, look for images directly through Book Creator, add them right in, you know, into their stories. It's very, like I said, user friendly and easy. Um, students can edit their own books. I'm just going to kind of keep all these settings on for now, just for, like I said, time and modeling purposes. But pretty much what happens is that students are able to, once they, um, once you create their library and they log in, you have to give them a code. It's a one-time code that they type in. And once it's in, then they don't have to keep, you know, retyping it. Then they have the ability to create their own books and edit their own books directly on their devices. So, um, 
what I'm going to do real quick is just kind of show you, you can create a new book. So you have the ability, um, the students have the ability and you also have the ability to, to create either like a square one by one, which is usually one of the more popular options. The comics are a huge hit with students of all age levels. So they have, they have the ability to do that as well. Or something that is fairly new to book creator are these templates. So you have the option to you know, pick a template that you want your students to use. They can also pick a template on their own, depending on the age level. So really fun, really, like I said, kind of like an engaging way to do different, you know, projects virtually. So for now, I'm just going to do a square one by one. Um, students on their Chromebooks, like I said, once they create their cover page, they have the option to add as many pages as they would like. So you'll notice I'm kind of clicking right now through creating multiple pages. So I'm going to go back to my cover. And the, the actual interface of it is there's not really much going on, as you can see. So everything is that you need is mostly on that top right hand corner. So you can import images by clicking on import, um, going through that Google search. So something I always usually search for for my examples is penguins. So we're going to pretend my book is on penguins today. So if I type in the word penguin or as a student, you know, students type in the word penguin, they'll get all these different images that they can pick from. They also, which is really new, and I think this is awesome, especially for our younger friends, is the option, you know, students at the younger age level aren't really able to type well and you know are still learning how to spell and things like that so they have the option to actually talk into the computer and instead of typing in penguin they can say penguin and search for images that way too which is really cool so i'm just going to click an image right here um, i can double click on it or i can press add so i'm going to do that it takes a couple seconds to load and then you have the ability to you know make the image smaller bigger place it wherever you want in the plus, there's also the option to take a photo. You'll notice before students take photos of themselves um, to, you know, show like they're the author. So that's really easy to use on the Chromebook. It's it's really great. The pen option, like I said, that's a very popular hit. Book Creator has all these embedded tools and things with the pen option. They can change the color and the style and all these emojis. I know everyone loves emojis nowadays, right? So it's really user friendly and great to use within um, the Book Creator platform text you know your usual text so if i wanted to just type in something here i can press done i can move it wherever i want and then i have the ability later on to make the text bigger smaller change the color center it you know all that stuff that you would normally be able to do like on a you know google document or a google slide or anything like that changing background colors making it really fun and then the last um tool really here is the record option. So on the Chromebooks, the only thing you have just have to make sure you tell your students, and it's happened many times, <laughs> um, but just to allow their microphone. And then once they allow their microphone once on Book Creator, they won't have to allow it again, and they can just continue to use um, the microphone option for anything they want to record. So then they can start recording, add their sound in. It's really awesome. So pretty much, I mean, like I said, it's really user friendly for as early as kindergarten and first grade, which I've used it as, and then like, you know, the age levels above. Students have the ability to create their own books and the teachers can actually publish them, like a whole library of them and send them out, which I know, for instance, um, another example I didn't get a chance to show, but in fourth grade, we had our students and teachers create memory books after this year. And the, after all the students did their books, the teacher in just a couple clicks was able to publish the whole library. The link is only for people that have the link, right? So it's not like going in a Google search. It is it is secure within that regards, um, but it is a really fun tool. It's very user friendly, um, even for, you know, for teachers that are just starting off and it's something I really do recommend, especially on the Chromebook. So I know that was a kind of a quick overview on Book Creator, but like I said, if um, there's tons of information on the website and stuff like that, and feel free if um, I'll share my email at the end if anyone wants to reach out with any questions. But I do wanna spend the last um, little bit of time I have focusing on Seesaw. And uh, Seesaw, I wanted to definitely focus on Seesaw because it's been a educational technology tool that has greatly helped um, a lot of districts and just kind of speaking on my behalf, my district at the start of the pandemic. So just a little background, like I said, I do have a focus, my current job with preschool through fourth grade and back in March of 
you know, 2020, we were talking about the preschool level, what to do. They don't have email accounts. They can't use Google Classroom. Like, what are we going to do as a platform? And I did some research and I found that Seesaw was very user friendly, awesome with the Chromebooks, which I'll get into in just a moment. So we decided to, you know, trial the free version, buy the subscription, and it has been life changing, not only for preschool, but also for everyone in elementary. And we are lucky enough to have the subscription up until fifth. But just to um, to kind of go over that quickly, so Seesaw is a tool and that you, students can use um, that is, I wouldn't say, there's a lot of differences and similarities between Google Classroom, but just kind of on the Chromebook perspective, that built-in PDF editor that they have that students are able to, you know, write and draw on their screens. They're able to you know, submit their assignments. Teachers are able to give them feedback easily. Students can listen to it on their devices. It is just, it is just incredible. So it's been used for many different subjects, many different, you know, areas to focus on. Um, I mean, I just wanted to show one example right now and just kind of show you what the interface looks like. But like I said, um, as for for like, um, you know, Chromebook perspective and stuff like that, for students to be able to orally explain what they're doing. So this is a kindergarten sound example. This teacher was um, able to own oh, actually, you know what, I'm gonna actually show, hold on one second here. You know what I'm gonna do instead of showing this example, cause I'm gonna actually switch over. I just wanna show on Seesaw, like the actual platform here, like what it looks like and stuff. And I'll show you some examples from this end, just because I wanna make sure I do spend some time on that as well. Um, but pretty much like any, like anything, like with Book Creator before too, when you sign up, you just have to pick like what grade level you teach, like your basic information. Um, and then once you get through that, the biggest difference, um, between, like I said, Seesaw and Google Classroom is it does have that built-in um, editor for the students to use. So just to kind of show you what that looks like, um, if you go to um, like student work here, I'm just gonna kind of show you what the students would see on their ends. They are able to, on the Chromebooks, they're able to add text really easily to any assignments. They're able to add, you know, their voice recording, which is fun. They love to do that. They all, you know, love to hear themselves talk and walk through different assignments, which is great. They can take, just like Book Creator before, they can take photos of themselves. They can take videos and upload things, which is really great and easy to use on the Chromebooks. Um, I know this was kind of mentioned before, but with the Chromebooks, Chromebooks, you know, you can save pictures and stuff like that into your files and drive. So they're able to pull that up really easily into Seesaw, which is which is awesome. And then you, they have all these different tools on the bottom here to draw, to write, to pick different colors, um, to get really fancy with like the, the highlighter and stuff like that. So um, it is just, like I said, very, very user friendly. And even for, um, if, even if you teach like second, third and fourth grade and students are able to kind of type more at that point, they're also are a ton of different activities and stuff like that that you can explore in the community library. So just to kind of show you what that looks like. And like I said, I have all this information in the slides because there is a lot of moving parts to this. But just to kind of show you what an activity would look like, um, once you sign up for Seesaw free version or not, you have access to this community library and teachers from all across the country are able to submit lessons, um, you know, from as early as, like I said, preschool, and you can kind of search and filter for lessons that you want. So in the lessons, um, so for instance, I'm actually gonna go to my library because I saved some of these before. Like if you are teaching, you know, at the kindergarten grade level and you're doing 10 frames, um, a lot of these, you know, activities that are pre-made or even ones that you can make. You can add directions in there really easily with all these little symbols. Um, you can even add, which I think is incredible, um, instead of, you know, if you're teaching a younger grade level and they can't read yet, you can add those voice directions in there too, which the students can easily listen to on their Chromebook devices and be able to complete the assignment without maybe, you know, asking for an adult to help. So they are able to, you know, complete the assignment. Um, you're able to assign using Seesaw to specific students or a whole class. Um, but just to kind of show you really quickly what that looks like from a student ends, um, you know, once a student logs into Seesaw, they get into your class. Something that, um, you know, Chromebook specific too is students can log in with their Google accounts. So they have the ability to just a click of a bucket, bu 
click of a button, click on their name, log right in, one, two, three. It's very seamless. They don't have to, you know, enter in codes if they're into the Chromebook already. They don't have to take photos and put in all this stuff. It's very easy to just log right in. Um, and then, you know, once they're in, they see their activities, whatever schedule for the day, they are able to, you know, read the directions, figure out what they need to do, complete the assignment, right? So I'm not going to, for time's sake, complete the assignment, but let's just say, um, you know, I'm good and I'm ready to go. I can just check it off and wait for my teacher to give me approval. And everything is compiled in this online journal, which keeps a record of everything from, you know, the year. And then if you decided to go with the paid subscription, you can carry that over from year to year. So like I said, I mean, that is a you know very brief overview of um, Seesaw and Book Creator. They are two of my, I wouldn't say, there's a ton of right, educational technology tools we use on a day-to-day -day basis and you know everything has their own use. But for Chromebook specific, I do feel after you know being a tech facilitator for multiple years, being in different grade levels, that I do um, agree that Book Creator and Seesaw have made such an impact with the students that I've worked with, um, even, you know, different sessions and stuff I've ran. They, um, even if you're a little skeptical trying it out, you know, it doesn't hurt just to log in, create an account, click around, and um, you'll be surprised how quick you and yourself and your students will be able to, you know, um, be able to use it and apply it to your own needs. So I hope that was helpful. Um, and at the end, like I said, I'll kind of share my email because I know there was a lot of information and um, I want to, you know, answer any questions that anyone has at a later time. But thank you so much, Lisa, again, for having me. I hope that was helpful. And um, yeah, thank you again. Brianna, you made it all look very, very <laughs> simple. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that we had in the chat was with the free version of Book Creator, how many books can you create? So I Googled it, it's, it's 40 books. But could you talk a little bit about, um, because I believe you have access to the paid version of Book Creator. What, why, why on these tools, like what do you get for paying for it versus, you know, what can you accomplish with just the free version, if, if, if you know off the top of your head? Yeah, of course. So I've used, like I said, both the free version in a previous district that I was in, and I've used the paid version in Melbourne. So with Book Creator specific, you have the 40 books. Um, if you have the paid subscription, you have like pretty much an unlimited li amount of libraries you can create. So if you are teaching and at an elementary level and you want to do, you know, books, let's just say on math specific, walking through different math problems, and you want to create a whole nother library of, you know, um, having students create stories, you're able to kind of keep them all active at one time with that paid version compared to having to archive and like, you know, recreate a library and then archive it again. I mean, to be honest with you, I do feel that for um, to start off, like you can definitely get yourself, you know, buy with the free version. There's there's no issues with that whatsoever. It's just a matter of, you know, maybe a couple extra minutes on setting things up and stuff like that, I would have to say. I feel that's kind of the case with all the ed tech tools, right? We use the freemium version and until we know that this is going to be successful and we're going to have great adoption and then we invest the funding in it because we know it's going to be worth it, you know? Mm -hmm, exactly. And then the same thing for Seesaw as well. Um, but they, the one quick thing I just want to mention about Seesaw with the free compared to the paid is that for the free version, you can have only two, you know, two teachers onto those Seesaw accounts. You can create as many, you know, as you want, but with the paid, you can have up to 20. Awesome. Uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate everything that you just showed us. And we'll see you again at the Demo Slam in a little while. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, see you soon. Um, so before we bring Joe on to talk about Chrome for personal productivity and professional productivity, I just wanted to mention that Apps Events, we have another arm of the company called AE Learning Lab, and we work directly with ISTE to provide ISTE certification training. Um, you can find more about the ISTE certification training with AE Learning Lab at bit.ly slash ISTE online. And don't forget that things are case sensitive. Um, and I'll give that link again a little later, or you could just Google Apps Events and ISTE and you will find it. Uh, also, um, I think we're ready for Joe and he's gonna talk about some favorite extensions. So Joe, I'm gonna go ahead and add you to the stream and once you screen share, I can add that as well. And then when Joe's done, I'll be talking to you guys about Chrome and Chromebook, you know, all the new features over the last few months.
So take it away, Joe. All right. <clears throat> Again, thank you for having me today. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak to you guys a little bit today about some of the different features and, and, and uh, things that we can use for productivity to kind of streamline our everyday workflow. Uh, link to the slide deck is included on the screen here. Um, and if you need it later too, um, I'll try to get this in the chat or if you just have any questions, you can contact me directly. Uh, again, just brief introduction. Like I said, my name is Joe McClung. I'm assistant superintendent for schools. Um, I have experience in kindergarten all the way through ninth grade, but I'll now I'm a, I'm a middle school educator by heart. Um, that's why I always include the, my middle school picture, just so that way we can always remember where we came from and how important those years are. Um, but that is a little bit about me. Again, located in Northwest Arkansas and pleasure to be with you guys today. Contact information is located at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter and also to my email address is listed there below as well. So what we'll do today, the format that I have for you guys is we'll kind of go back and forth between the presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce a few products to you and then we'll go over a brief demo of each one of those as we move throughout. But before we get anything started, we have to start in the web store. So everything that I'll be sharing with you today can be found in the web store uh, as an extension for your Chrome browser. So the very first one that we'll do today is we're going to look for the product called Drive Quick Create. So just a brief summary of this before we get into uh, actually demonstrating this product. Uh, so what Drive Quick Create allows you to do is allows you to create documents on the fly so that you don't have to navigate back to your Google Drive in order to hit create, find a doc or find a form or find a sheet. But you can do it just straight from your browser. So I'm going to back out of my presentation and then I'm going to go over to my tab where I already have the Chrome Web Store pulled up. And then drive quick create. Okay, so once you have it added to your browser, which mine's already added, you'll notice that you have the button up here in the top. Um, if you do not see the icon for the quick access in your menu, chances are it's probably hidden below your puzzle piece here, which we'll talk a little bit more later on. Um, but for now, I have it pinned up here to my taskbar. So whenever I want to actually utilize this tool, all I have to do is click on the icon. And then straight from here, it'll ask me, what do I want to create? Do I want to create a doc, spreadsheet, presentation, drawing, or form? So everything is automatically linked to my drive. So once I hit, I need to create a new doc, automatically brings me here, um, log into my drive, and I can save myself a few extra clicks and a little bit of navigation going back and forth between my drive and between uh, my documents. So again, that was Drive Quick Create. Staying in the topic of Drive, the next one that I want to share with everybody is called Save to Drive. So the benefit to having Save to Drive onto your browser is that whenever you're on a website, uh, whether it's a PDF or you want to do a screenshot, you can use this tool in order to create, uh, create a file within your Google Drive. So let's see how this works real quick. So I'm going to navigate back to my tab that has the web store pulled up. Now notice, and sometimes it's hard to differentiate which one is which because we've just talked about two different drive uh, tools that we can use. But I can always hover over and see that this is my saved drive icon. Again, remember, if you don't see it in your taskbar, you can always find it underneath your puzzle piece. But for this particular website and this tool, if I click save to drive, if I click save to drive, it'll prompt me. Oh, there we go. It'll prompt me and it'll say that it'll save a, a screenshot. Let's try that again. There we go. This will be a better example, sorry about that. If I hit save to drive, it'll prompt me in the left-hand corner of my screen, and it'll say that you have saved this website, and it'll save it as a PNG file. So if I wanna pull that up, it'll already be within my Google Drive, but basically what it's done is it's created a screenshot of whatever I was just looking at. Now, one of the limitations to this is you can't do just normal documents. Um, so I can't go to a, a, you know, a Microsoft equivalent document and then expect it to save to my drive accordingly. But what it will do is if you find a PDF and you want to save that PDF directly to your drive, you can go through the same process and it'll save that PDF within your Google Drive. So real quick, I'm going to purge a couple of tabs here and then I'm going to navigate back to my presentation. And then we're going to shift gears a little bit, move from organization and putting things into our drive to kind of 
keeping up with everything that we have going on, whether it's our tasks or different events that we have going. So the next one I want to review with you is called Google Keep. And just like the product that you have on your phone or that you may have on your phone, this is a good way for you to keep any type of menu or any type of, excuse me, list or any type of to-do list on your phone. And it all has a nice integration between your browser, your phone, and the web application. So once I have this one downloaded into my extensions, I can go up here to where it says save to keep. And then what will happen is whenever I create that, the functionality that I get as an extension in my browser is that it will save the website that I'm currently looking at and I can take a note regarding this particular website. Okay, So this will save directly to my keep files and then I can go in and interact with these on the web application or the app for my mobile device. Uh, but as you can see, I have a lot of the same fun uh, functionalities that would have in a normal keep application, such as tagging it with labels. So I can add those in there, or if I decide that I just don't want this at all, I can trash and move on. So next up um, is add to classroom. So add to classroom is a replacement for share to classroom. So if you're familiar with this at all, um, one of my favorite extensions prior to, uh, prior to it uh, no longer being um, kept up to date was share to classroom, which allows you to basically take whatever you're looking at on your screen and then create an assignment announcement um, or a question straight to your Google Classroom. Uh, this is a workaround for that. This is a good replacement for the previous extension called Shared Classroom. So once I have Add to Classroom downloaded to my browser, I'll get my icon up here. It'll be a green circle with a yellow plus in it. And here's how it works in practical sense. So I'm going to click my icon. I'll have to click on Classroom. Now, since this is all synced up with my one Google account, notice it'll pull up my profile and then it'll ask me which class do I want to share this to. So I'm going to find level two bootcamp and then I have an action. So just any type of functionality that you would normally have in classroom where you can create an assignment, uh, ask a question, make an announcement, or even add course materials. You can do all this from this location as well. So if I was to create an announcement or create an assignment rather, notice as I go in here, it looks exactly the same as it would if I was in Google Classroom. I have all the same functionalities here, all the settings that you would have in Classroom as well where I can differentiate which students it goes to, what the point value is, title instructions, but also notice this. Since I was on this particular website, when I clicked my extension, it automatically links it directly to my assignment. So my students would then have access to whatever I was viewing. So again, saves you a couple of steps. You don't have to navigate all the way to Classroom in order to be able to create an assignment for your students in Google Classroom. And again, the name of that one was Add to Classroom. So this is a good time for, for a, a PSA, so a public service announcement, because it becomes real easy to overload or, or bog down your browser with a ton of extensions. Um, and these are easily shared and people always have their favorite extensions. It's always worth trying them out. However, if you get to a point where you wanna kind of clear up some of that clutter, I highly recommend it. So as we talked about earlier, we have that puzzle piece that has all of our extensions hidden behind it. Notice in there that you can also pin your favorite extensions to your browser so that you can easily access them. So for the sake of today's presentation, I found the ones that I'll plan on demoing with you and I pin them directly to my browser. However, on a normal day today, I'm probably not gonna have Classroom pinned to my browser because I, I don't have students assigned to me. So if I remove that pin, notice it removes itself up here and I get rid of some of that clutter. On that hand as well, keep in mind you can always rearrange these just by clicking and dragging and placing your icon where you want to appear within your toolbar. So that's my, my one bit of uh, clean up the clutter PSA. Uh, now moving on to another product, and this is probably one of my favorite ones in my role as administrator is um, the bit.ly extension for your browser. So the way the bit.ly works is it allows you to take those clunky URLs that you're normally used to sharing with parents and condense them down to something that's more easy to digest and also something they can remember as a quick URL. So for instance, to demonstrate this one, we're gonna have our parent communication document. Now let's say that this is a newsletter that I wanna send out to the parents of my school district. 
Now, as opposed to trying to go through here and share the URL directly with them, I now have my icon up here for bit.ly. And when I click on it, it'll bring up a sidebar over on the right hand side. And notice that it'll automatically give me associated it'll automatically spit out a URL for me to use. Okay. So this one is drastically better because it's condensed down. It's pretty easy to share. But the nice thing that I like to do is I like to customize these for special events that we have. So for instance, if I wanted to send out a welcome back to the school year letter to my parents, I can call it my school FJHS welcome. And I can say 21. Now, if that, if that particular customized URL is available, then I should be able to, we're going to hit save at the bottom. Okay. So it was available. So now what I can do is as opposed to worrying about how I can share something easily with my parents or with my students, I can now have that custom URL and I can share it. Let's say go to bit.ly slash FJHS welcome 21 makes it a lot easier for families and for students to navigate uh, lengthy URLs. And also too, if you're in charge of any type of social media for your school or organization, this is a great way to kind of convey that information out to your, your, um, your followers on social media as well. All right, coming down the stretch, a couple more applicator, a couple more uh, extensions to review with you. Uh, Screencastify. So this is one that I think a lot of people relied on um, in the past year and a half with the pivot to virtual learning that we've seen all across, uh, really all across the, the world. So Screencastify allows you to take screenshots or record short videos of your instruction or your demonstrations on your computer and make those very easy to share. So once I have that added, my icon will look up here at the top. It'll have a little arrow with the camera in it. So whenever I'm ready to record, I can go ahead and start my recording. Notice you'll have some settings here to, to configure. So figure out what do you want to share. Do I want to share my entire desktop or just one tab? Um, or do I just want to take webcam only, which is just recording of me? So for now, I'm going to say desktop. My microphone and my webcam are set up correctly. I'm going to hit record. Share my screen. And then we should get our countdown. And we're live. So now I'm recording my lesson for students that I can then easily share on my Google Classroom. But also the cool thing with this product is I have the embedded annotation features. So as I demonstrate something for, our, for my teachers or my students, I should say, um, I can annotate on the screen. I can also add stickers, which are fun, right? And then I can also race or I can add shapes in here. So it gives us just an extra level of um, functionality in there that we can use to really enhance our virtual education, our virtual teaching experience for our students. Um, whenever I'm done, or if I just wanted to pause, I can pause it, okay, and then I can resume when I want to, or for the sake of this one, I'm done with this lesson. So I'm gonna hit stop. And then I'll get a prompt that'll pull up, and it'll give me the details from my video. So I can preview this. Notice at the bottom, I have the ability to clip this. So if, I, if my instruction ran too long or if I had something that I stumbled over as I was delivering instruction, I could clip um, and shorten that. Um, also too, over here on the right-hand side, notice it's automatically integrated into my Google Drive. So this video will save into its own folder, my Google Drive, which then makes it easy to share in Classroom or through another uh, LMS and or I can also download it straight from here as well. So it's really nice, really, really easy to access and um, it's probably the most straightforward screen sharing tool that you can use for your daily instruction or to share with educators. Um, one thing on that note, um, just like we talked about the previous presentation, there is a paywall. So with the free version, you get five minutes, uh, five minute tops video. So if you feel like that you can comfortably record your lessons and not have to spend the money on the paid version, then this is perfect for you without having to do the paid version for this tech tool. All right, one more. Um, I should also mention too, on each one of these slides, um, we do have the, um, we have the product link within the image. So if you are looking for these, it's just real quick and easy. You can click on that image and access that. The last one that I want to review with you is called Event Merge. Now this is particularly useful 
um, in my role because I have a lot of shared calendars between myself, other directors, um, other school leaders within my district. Um, and a lot of times we'll have repeat events that just kind of clutter up your Google calendar and make it hard to read quickly. So the way that this works is it takes any repeat event and it merges them together in an easy to read format for you on your Google calendar. So we'll see what this looks like in practice. So the nice thing about this is once you have it downloaded as an extension to your browser, um, it does the rest unless you tell it otherwise. So notice some examples in here. As I look down at my calendar, football duty is listed right here. So this is upcoming after the start of school. I have administration duty on one night and it is listed as football duty. It is on two of my calendars, so my work and my personal calendar. So notice what it does. It now combines those and it mixes the colors together too. So I can quickly at a glance know that blue is my personal calendar and then red is my professional calendar. So it's taken care of for me and I don't have to worry about it. So this works for any of your shared events or I'm sorry, any of your duplicate events, I should say. And it's a great way to take that normal you know, task of trying to clean up a Google Calendar and make it nice and condensed and easy to read for all users that use this. Now, if you ever want to toggle it off, again, it's located up in the top right hand corner of our browser. Um, I can always toggle this. It'll refresh my page. And then notice down here on my football duty, it has now separated it back out. Oh, my apologies. It has now separated it back out to the two events. If I want to turn it back on, just toggle and it'll go right back to where it was. So um, that, I believe, is the end of my time. So I'll turn it back over to Lisa. Well, Joe, I, I don't want to deprive anybody of Cami. So if we could take another what? minute. Is what, to... Cami the last one? Yeah, let's do it. So this is kind of a this is kind of a misnomer. It's an extension, but not really per se. Um, it is available in extensions, just a shortcut. But this is another one. If I was going to prioritize tech tools um, that kind of helped my teachers in particular get through this past year virtually into digital or pivoting to virtual learning, um, it would be Screencastify and Cami. So what Cami allows you to do is it allows you to take some of your PDFs and some of your other documents and make them easy to maneuver and manipulate. Um, and also, too, this is a tool that your students can use if you buy a school license. But again, just throwing in that disclaimer, there is a paywall for this. So I do have Cami downloaded as an extension on my browser. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up Cami. So again, going back to what I said, this is an extension, but eh, not really. Um, so it brings us to the website for Cami, and then I can go directly to my drive and I can open up any of the documents within my drive. So um, where I really find the most power in this is through PDF. So we'll use a PDF as our example. So I'm going to locate a PDF, select it, and off we go. So now we have our PDF. Um, if, if I were to manipulate this, and let's say for in particular for me, um, I have terrible penmanship, so Cami always comes in really handy when I need to fill out a PDF. Um, so on this right now, um, notice on the left-hand side, I have my different tools for annotation, uh, for any type of markup that I wanna do on this PDF. Where I commonly use it is adding text boxes. So if I need to add a text box to fill out my information, I can quickly access those just by clicking on the tool and then clicking where I want that particular tool to go. So I can add my text boxes as I go down the menu here. But notice too, over on the left-hand side, we also have options to make it more collaborative as well. So we have that comment tool that we can add in here. Uh, we can also annotate with markup or with drawing or shape. So we can highlight text, which is really handy going back to our um, accessibility features and things that'll help students take that digital format and make it more manageable um, whenever, they're, whenever they're trying to utilize their, their computers. Um, but we can use those tools to annotate the text um, and also make it more accessible for our students. That's pretty awesome. Actually, one of our viewers, Mazrina, she says she uses Cami for marking up um, online exams. And I know at my school, like we couldn't have gotten through math this past year without Cami for sure. 
Yeah, in our school too, our English teachers love it because they can, you know, everything's moving digital and, and English teachers love to annotate text. They love to highlight text. This gives them that option to do it in digital format uh, where students can easily turn it back into them. So there's there's tons and tons of features and functionalities in there that would be help, uh, helpful to teachers. So, Joe, that was awesome. And I knew I'd pick up at least one thing from you. Event merge is a game changer for me. I already installed it. <laughs> Good deal. I'm glad I got some out of it. So. Yeah, absolutely. And and you just you, you kind of took me on a little um, stroll down memory lane on like everything that we used this year that like we couldn't have gotten through hybrid learning and remote learning without them, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll do a quick plug for Screencastify. You know, we have a paid subscription at, at, at work and I used to pay for my own subscription. But man, is it a powerful tool for the free version? And the only real difference is two things. One, you're limited to a five minute recording. And why are you recording more than five minutes? <laughs> and two, um, the editing tools, you know, they're they're pretty powerful editing tools. Um, I use them with my students all the time and and, and it's nice. Good deal. That's nice. Yeah. Joe, thank you so much. And we're going to see you back for the demo slam, right? Yep. We'll see you then. All right. Um, so I also wanted to bring up that uh, we are Apps Events is a recommended certified coaching partner with Google. This is a relatively new program with Google. You know, it's just a few years old and um, we can work with you and your school or district or organization um, to bring a cohort of uh, educators through the certified coaching program. It's a pretty intense curriculum and um, a pretty intense application to apply to be a certified coach, but you could do it. I know you can. Um, I've switched back to my Chromebook here. So um, I want to be demoing just some newer um, features of Chrome and Chromebooks. So I figured um, let's start with Chrome because I know we're all probably using Chrome right now, but not all using Chromebooks. So the first thing that I wanted to draw your attention and some of it I'm going to live demo, some of it I'm going to just talk about. But the first thing I wanted to mention in updates to Chrome is the password manager and it's pretty robust. Um, you can Google the password manager. I'm going to show you a couple different ways to get to it. But basically, it's going to show you if you have duplicate, weak, or compromised passwords, which is pretty cool. So this screenshot over on the right, I did on my Apps Events account. And it told me, I mean, I felt pretty great. No compromised passwords. I had three passwords that I had used in, you know, one password I'd used in uh, three places and one with a weak password. And I was able to go in and change that. So the question is, you know, really, how did I get to that? So one of the things I can do real simply, if I don't know any of the shortcuts, because we are going to be talking about some shortcuts, but you can always go into settings and set and search for things. So I can go here and just search for passwords and it'll bring it up for me. So I can come on here into passwords and it'll show all of my passwords. You know, I can click on the eyeball there and be able to get to it. But I can also um, go back here and um, do the safety check. So the safety check will allow me to find any breach in, in passwords or anything like that. The next thing that I wanted to talk about, um, I believe the next thing I wanted to mention it are Chrome Actions. So when I think about Chrome Actions, um, there's a whole list of different actions I can do in Chrome. So if I go ahead and click on this link here, and we're going to do one of them as a demonstration. But if I click on this link, it gives me all of these different actions that I can do in the Chrome browser to make changes or view things in Chrome. And if we look here, um, you'll actually see manage passwords as one of them. So in the settings menu, we did it. We clicked on passwords and we were able to manage our passwords. But on a Chromebook, I can also go and I'll use change password as an example. I can go up here into the Omnibox and we all know how powerful the Omnibox is. It's not just for URLs. We can do commands there too. And I can go ahead 
and type manage passwords and I didn't even finish typing it and I'll see this little Chrome action, it's that little gray bar that comes up and I can click on it and it will launch it for me. So another thing, and, and I'll try to do it here um, on my Google Doc for today, if I go ahead and I start typing translate, um, oops, I didn't type it right, translate page, and look, a little Chrome action came up there. It'll ask me, you know, what language I want to um, translate it to and so on and so forth. So that's pretty cool about um, an update to Chrome um, for us to think about utilizing. Now, another update to Chrome was grouping tabs. And I don't know if you've seen this, but it's color coded. And I know some of my students really use this to keep themselves organized for their classes. So let's say they have three tabs open for their history class that's coming up and they go ahead and group the tabs. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I've got this YouTube video on the one of the Acer Chromebooks, and I'm going to go ahead to add tab to new group. I'm going to name the group Acer Resources, or that might be history, or that might be maths, or whatever it might be. And then I can pick from one of these colors here to group them together. So now I see that that group title comes up here. And I want to add to this my Google Doc for today. So I'm going to add that to the group. And you'd see any groups here that you had created. And then you can go ahead and add as many of them as you want. And then if you go to try to move your tabs, all of the grouped tabs will stay together. So let's say I wanted to give this a different color and I wanted to call you know, this a new group and I could just say um, uh, slide decks, right? And maybe I'd spell it right, maybe not. Um, but I can go ahead and color them. And then, then everything's grouped together and that co color coding is really super helpful for students. So that was also new uh, to Chrome this year. Now let's talk about some Chromebook updates. Um, the first one, and I think this is super, super important, is your diagnostics app. And I'm not sure that many of you are aware of this. This is great troubleshooting. So if I go ahead and I click my launcher, I can search here and you'll see I've had the diagnostics tool open because it shows me my most recent five, but I can also start typing diagnostics and it'll pop up for me. And this is what it does. It launches three separate types of diagnostic tests the battery test, the CPU test, and the memory test. Now, if I run these right now, they will slow down my Chromebook and I won't be able to do the rest of my demonstrations. But this is a really great troubleshooting tool if you're the person that troubleshoots Chromebooks in your district. And I know I do a bit of that at the high school that I work at. So I wanted you to know that that was available to you. Let's go ahead and close that. And it's pretty obvious, you know, what the three different tests are, a charge test, a CPU test, and a memory test. And this is really great with the charge test to be able to see if you're having an issue with your battery or with your CPU if something is taking up all of the usage and slowing you down. The funny thing is, is it's typically Chrome that's doing that, right? The next update to Chromebooks that I wanted to talk about was Nearby Share. So if we do this, you'll see in your settings with Nearby Share, you can share your um, device or with your contacts. So like my Chromebook right here, I'm going to go into Settings. And my Chromebook is shared with my Android phone. So if I go ahead and I start typing in nearby, oh, maybe I need to go into Chrome OS settings. Sorry, I always get confused between the two. I, I hope I'm not alone with that one, right? But nearby, so turn on nearby share, you'll see that everything is shared with my, my, um, my smartphone so that I can easily transfer files between. And those of you that are Apple users, like, I mean, this is AirDrop, right? But it's really wonderful feature to be able to utilize. And then of course, if you're working in your colleagues, maybe you're doing some curriculum writing um, and you wanna share your device with um, and, and your files specifically for short term with one of your contacts, you can go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of that. 
And let's go on, take a look at the next one. The next one is new wallpapers and account images. Um, Google did a major update to what was available there. So I just wanna take a look at that real quick. And of course there's 18 different ways to get to this, but if you right click right on your Chromebook desktop, that's a two finger tab, and go to set wallpaper, one of the ones that Google really did a feature on was this imaginary one. And there's just these adorable, beautiful images for your Chromebook. But what I really like, and, and these are great and everything, but if I look at landscapes and there's a couple of other categories to do this, you'll see a daily refresh. And this is awesome because if I enable the daily refresh, and I remember to turn off my Chromebook, <laughs> but it'll refresh it anyway, it'll change daily for me and I'll have a different image every day, which I just absolutely love. Um, I remember when, you know, the CR48, the original Chromebook was released, like this wasn't even an option to go ahead and, and have something beautiful in your background. So I'll go ahead and leave that and that'll change for me tomorrow. Um, and I will come back to my deck here. So the next thing that I wanna talk about in our Chromebooks is I wanna talk about pinning files to your tote. So this is a new one. And down in the right hand corner here, you're gonna see that I have pinned files. Now, this is great if there's something that you, maybe there's um, an image that you've synced to your downloads or something, you can easily get to those files here. And now the question is, how do I pin a file, right? Well, I'm gonna go back to my launcher over here on the Chromebook and I can see that files are there, but what if it wasn't one of the last five things that I access? So I can go ahead here and I can type files and launch my files. So everybody on their Chromebook has a downloads folder, okay? And then of course, some of these newer Chromebooks even have like an SD slot so that you can have external storage and, and, and portable, right? So I'm gonna go ahead into downloads here and in my demos, oh, it's not here on this device, but I'm gonna go ahead and open up downloads and I'm gonna get maybe this, um, this screenshot here that I took. We'll talk about screenshots in a minute. If I right click on it, I see that I can pin it to the shelf. So when I click pin to shelf, and now I come down here to the tote, I can see now that that screenshot is pinned there and it's just easy to get to. It's just a nice new feature, just like our downloads folder, like the last couple of downloads are listed there in that tote. They call it the tote as well. If there's something that you no longer want pinned, you just click on the pin and it will be removed from your tote. Um, I don't know if there's a maximum things that you can, a uh, number of items that you can have pinned. I just actually thought of that question this second. So um, maybe somebody who's watching wants to look it up for me and let me know. All right. So the next thing that we want to talk about to updates on the Chromebook is the power of the launcher, right? Now the launcher, we can get to our apps and we can search for apps, but we can also do regular queries in there. So we can click on that that button or the button on our keyboard, right? Mine's right above my shift button on the left-hand side. And you'll see it even says there, search your device, apps, settings, and the web. So I could go here and I could even type weather if I wanted to, and it gives me the little preview right there. If I click on it, it is gonna open another tab for me. But what a nice, quick shortcut. And let's do that again then. I'm gonna open up that launcher and I'm gonna type, um, you know, what is five ounces in tablespoons? And um, I'm gonna go ahead and I can hit the enter button, but I can see the answer is right there. It's 10 US tablespoons. And I was able to find that answer without even opening another tab. And of course, if I hit enter, it does bring me to the tab with that information. So, so nice be able to use the launcher to search for quick answers to things. Let's come back to that slide deck. Whoops, sorry. Let's come back to that slide deck. And we've got a couple more still here. Um, the next one that we wanna talk is app 
badges. So we all have them on our smartphones. I, I'm pretty sure we all have them on our smartphones. We know if there's a notification in one of our apps on our iPhone or our Android phone, we see that little dot there, right? Well, we have it on Chromebooks now too. And But in order to see it, you have to toggle it on. So let's go into settings in the bottom right-hand corner and we're going to see it. You'll see it right there under notifications and you'll see app badging is turned on. If you have a notification in your launcher, when you see your app, you'll see that little blue dot in the top right hand corner. It doesn't show you like if you were thinking about Gmail as an app on a Chromebook, it won't show you, oh, you have three new emails. It doesn't give you a counter. It just gives you an indicator that you do have a notification in that specific app. And you'll see that you can turn it on um, for whichever apps you would like or um, maybe disable it for whichever apps you don't want to see it for, which is really nice. And then if you decide that you don't want app badging, you can simply go ahead and toggle it off there. All right. And then we're almost at the end, pin login. So um, pin login is relatively new. When I heard of pin login on the Chromebooks, I immediately actually thought of my colleague, Brianna, because I was thinking, you know, these, these pre-K, these four-year-old students are having to type passwords. Wouldn't it be great to have the pin? And then, of course, in the beginning of our time together, we saw the Acer Chromebooks with the uh, fingerprint recognition, which would be even better, right? Um, but you can, if it's if it's available in your domain, you can go in on the Chromebook and enable, we'll give that a second there. Wow. We'll, um, you can go into settings, into security and privacy, and enable a pin in addition to your password. It'll prompt you to type in your password, then it'll ask you for the pin digit, and then it'll ask you to confirm it, so six digits or more, and um, that's sweet. I do it on my Chromebook, but it's actually not enabled yet in my apps events domain, but I'll talk to Dan later about that and see if it's okay to enable. And then last but not least, before we get to the demo slam, we have screen capture on a Chromebook. I mean, yes, Screencastify is still like my first choice, but this is great. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and demo it. So right here, if I go into settings, I'll see screen capture as an option. Now I can either do a still screen capture, which we all know is so valuable, and I can do a screen recording. So for right now, I'll just do a still image. It says drag to select an area to capture. And let's say I just wanted to capture this right up here. Well, I can go ahead and capture that image, then click the capture button and it'll go right into my downloads folder. So I can edit that capture. And I've got tools up here where I can edit. So I can go ahead and get a scribbly. I can get, you know, a, a highlighter here. I can get yellow. I can go ahead and write all over it. I mean, this is phenomenal if you ask me. And then when I click done, it'll save those annotations. Okay, I click save and it's going to go right into my downloads folder. And then, of course, folks, what am I going to want to do? I'm going to want to pin it. So I go here, I go into my files, I go into my most recent screen capture. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on downloads. There's that screenshot right there. I'm going to go ahead and pin it. And now it is in my shelf right here. So it should be this one right here. There we go. All right. So those are some really great updates to Chrome and Chromebooks. Google's always making updates, hundreds and hundreds of them. So we know that there are more coming. So we are ready right now. We are going to be heading into our demo slam. And I'm going to put all of my friends back in the chat with us. So, um, oops, I was sorry. I was on the wrong screen. So I'm going to add Joe and Jen and Brianna. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're ready to show your demo slam. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it backwards. 
So I'll go last, but we'll have Joe go, then Brianna, then Jen, and then I'll go. Um, before we start the demo slam, I promised you a link to the YouTube video with all of our free, you know, we have so much content. We have the International Schools podcast. We've got um, all of our ACER sponsored virtual summits and a bunch of other stuff that Apps Events does as well. And you can find it all at video.com appsevents.com. Um, I also invite you to register for the Connected School Conference. Um, it's in October, so you can find that at theconnected.school. Um, and also, we do have an ISTE certification cohort starting um, at the end of October. Um, I know it's designed for Africa. That that just means the time for it. So come um, visit us at the AE Learning Lab and see all about the next rounds of certifications. So, um, Joe, we said we'd go, we'd have you go first. So I'm going to go ahead and and. Um, remove that from the stream and are you ready i'm not doing a timer okay. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not doing a timer um it's just the four of us having some fun and showing a, a quick new uh demo tool take it away joe all right um one of my favorite tools to to demo or, or to always share with teachers just because mainly feel it's underutilized is the google arts and culture website you can access that just by going to artsandcultures.google.com so this is just it's just a wealth of knowledge and it has so many great resources for educators to use and i always like to demonstrate just my favorite ways to use it as well so obviously as the name would imply you're going to have all kinds of access to great pieces of art and pieces from different artists throughout time. Um, but as a former history teacher myself, I love going over here to the left, to the three lines to navigate to the menu. And I love looking at the historical events. So as a history teacher, one of the things that I was always looking for was primary source documents or primary source, yeah, primary source documents, and then trying to find just different content that I can supplement, for my, supplement in for my students. So let's say that I'm teaching a World War II unit. Um, I'm able to access this information quickly um, notice as I click on the topic, it gives me a quick synopsis of the different collections that are in here. But also below, I get different phases within the war. So I can look at different collections based on just different just different points in time. So if I want to look at post-secondary kind of reconstruction after the war, I can go here and I can see the different collection as far as post uh, post war as it applies to the UK. In, the, in that theater. But it's really handy to, to use as a teacher to share with your students. And here's the other cool thing about it is that notice on each collection that you go to, you have the option to share directly. So going back to what we talked about earlier with sharing the classroom, notice I can go directly to my classroom and I can then start creating assignments from here as well. Uh, as well. So great resource, like I said, very under underutilized. I hope more people start to gravitate towards it. So. Awesome, Joe. I always love me some arts and culture. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Brianna, you're up. Awesome. I'm just going to share my screen because I don't think I had that before. Here we go. All right. Let me add you. All right. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about web paint. It's a great extension. And I know before I mentioned you know, some tools and educational technology tools that we use at the elementary level. A lot of the teachers that I work with this year did use web paint. So right now I just have um, a random website up called Starfall. We use that, like I said, at the elementary level, but I wanted to model for you how web paint works. So this extension is used to annotate on different websites, different documents, things like that. I know there's a ton of other resources out there. I know Cami was mentioned before, but something I like specifically about web paint that's different than all of those is it is easy to annotate on websites and things like that. So I'm just gonna model for you on Starfall, which is um, elementary friendly. So once you download the extension, you'll see here, after you click on it, there's a whole bunch of different tools that pop up. If you hover your mouse over the tools, it tells you what they are. And a lot of them are pretty straightforward just by kind of looking at the image. So for example, if I wanted to just use the pencil tool to draw a custom line, I can click on the pencil tool and I can also choose a color I'd like. So my favorite color is orange. So I'm going to use orange here. I can change the transparency. I can change the size, which is great. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm um, using the calendar. I can easily like start what day of the week it is okay i can draw i can do whatever i want if i want to start off a certain day 
So it's really easy to, you know, use um, on the Chromebooks because the Chromebooks, you know, have that touchscreen capability, which is awesome. So I am going to um, right now, let's just say I don't want that on anymore and I want to be able to erase. There is the option to erase all. So I'm going to clear that. And then you'll notice that there are a variety of different tools, such as the color picker. This one I actually really like. I've found a lot of teachers who use this. Um, and what this is, is you pick a color from the web page and you can use it for your drawing. So let's just say, for example, and for you know this example here, it's not really that critical that I get the same color, but just to kind of model. If I wanted that same exact purple that's here for August, you'll notice that once I click on it, it actually changed over here in the tool section, which is awesome. It can do the same for here, for the watermelon, or even for that orange. And then I can go back to that same pencil tool I used before, and it mirrors that color, which is, like I said, pretty cool. Um, then there's like a text option here. So if I click here and then I can easily, you know, type in some different letters or wherever I want to do text. There's a bunch of different line tools here you can use for math and arrows. So if I wanted to do like an exact arrow, I have the ability to change that there. There's some shapes and things like that, which are really awesome. Um, if you wanted to just like paint bucket and change the whole screen to a certain color, you also have the ability to do that. Um, but something I just wanted to kind of end with, which I really enjoy, and I think a lot of my teachers have used this before and found it to be extremely helpful, is after you're done annotating. So let me actually make a couple more annotations just to kind of model for you how this works. So I'm just going to star off here. I'm going to circle here. I'm going to circle here. Okay. I can actually take a picture of all my annotations by um, clicking on this little camera option here to screenshot. And then you'll notice on the top left, there are some options. I can download this really easily um, to, you know, I'm using a Mac computer right now, but if you're using the Chromebook, obviously it goes into your downloads. And then you do have the option even to print, copy to clipboard or to crop. So like I said, I know there's other tools out there that do have annotations, but WebPaint I know has been very useful for the elementary level. And um, it is especially great with those websites and things that aren't usually easy to annotate. I've been so impressed with web paint. I think it was Dan who showed it to us, Dan at work, right? Dan Gallagher. It's amazing like to be able to do all of that on top of a web page without like really installing like anything. It's so robust. It's great. And even in school too, with the smart boards and stuff like that, if you're having problems with, you know, um, the smarting tools, you can even use it. There's so many different ways. Yeah. Sweet. Thanks for sharing, Brianna. Of course. Um, Jen, you're up. You're muted. Do you want us to come back to you? Oh, no. Okay. No, I'm ready. I'm sorry. There we go. So do you see the green screen in front we of you? Do. Uh, we see the Chrome Web Store. Yes, perfect. All right. So I am here to talk to you about IRAD, the tutorial builder. And if you're somebody like me that is a coach, um, you know that you're making a lot of tutorials, a lot of collateral to support your, your teachers and your students. And this is also really, really great for teachers as well, especially when you're looking to create um, documents that are translated and walk through. So basically, our IRAD is a wonderful tool. It sits right up here on my browser. And what I want to do is just navigate. For example, maybe I want to show my teachers how to navigate the Apps Events webpage. So I just simply click on IRAD right here, and I decide to capture. It'll give me a little cue here, and I could start capturing. So before, close all tabs. During capture, perform action slowly. Finish capture by clicking on the blinking extension. So if I click start, it gives me a countdown. And let's say I would like to know uh, more about uh, custom PD. So I click on Google, I click on custom PD. I could see more information here. If I want, I can click on the catalog. It opens up a new page. And let's say I want to stop my tutorial there. So I click on IRAD up here. And it's going to render a tutorial for me. Here we go. And you'll see that right now it has captured five steps for me. 
So as I'm moving around, you'll see the first step is to open that this page and click here and it's captured that action for me. I can go to, now is this a left click or did I have to double click or do I have to open the link? I can also change the text here if I want to. And as I'm moving through, you'll see that it's changing the areas that I've highlighted or change the directions that are going. And it goes to the catalog and it should navigate to wherever I tell it to go. Now I can also add audio. So if I click on add audio here, I could choose uh, the language that I want it to be in. Uh, I have a test voice. When you have the, the paid version of this, you have some really, really nice functionality with that as well. And you can mask the content if I wanted to hide anything as far as or zoom in on a specific feature. I can even delete steps. When you're making more in-depth tutorials, sometimes you'll find you don't need all the granular steps. So if I preview and finish, it'll do a number of things for me. So first, it creates this particular tutorial that will actually be like a web page. So people can navigate through just by simply clicking. So, and I can replay this, I can copy this link and I can, let me just close out of this particular thing right here. Don't you hate it when like navigational menus just like change on you? I'm gonna complete this. Now, what I wanna show you, there's my X, there we go, is all of my menus here. So these are all of the different tutorials that I've created. Once I've created a tutorial, if I click on them, I can go through a number of things. I can, trans I can translate each one of the tutorials. So in my previous district, we uh, were 54% Latinx uh, population with a high amount of uh, ENL students or newcomers. So the translation feature was huge for us just to help our families learn how to navigate our sites and learn how to navigate all of our software. So each one of my instructional coaches all had subscriptions to IRAD, including all of our um, our uh, PR people and our people in the district as far as communications. And you can see that you also get analytics, so you know how many people are actually accessing your tutorials. These will also print in PDFs. And like I said, the language shifting is, the language translation is huge. And when I change language, I can also have press play and have an audio overlay on that. And it will also speak the language as well. So it just provides um, a very easy to create tutorial where it's basically just following my mouse clicks. I can fill in any information I'm missing and it just makes my work as a coach that much easier. And that's it. I love it. I actually had not seen that demoed yet. So thank you for showing that. Oh my gosh, this is like really fierce competition. So I'm glad that there's not going to be a winner that we didn't have people vote. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. All right. I am going to go ahead and talk about Moat. So Moat's one of my new favorite tools. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty intense because it works, um, well, it is um, a Chrome extension. So you would go to the Chrome web store and search for Moat. It's voice notes and feedback. Um, Moat works across Gmail, Google Docs, Google Classroom, Google Forms. Um, but what I wanna show you right now is I actually wanna show you Google Slides because um, one of the things that we've all struggled with is adding audio to Google Slides. And in the past, you know, once we were able to add audio, we had to go to something like online voice recorder, record the audio, put the audio in Google Drive, then insert that audio into our Google Slide Deck. But we had to make sure that the sharing settings on the Google audio file, the audio file match the sharing settings of the Google slide. And I've already lost half of you because it was such, it was difficult. So here we're going to use Moat to add audio to Google slide. So I'm going to go ahead and click the Moat symbol in the top right hand corner, click to start. I have 30 seconds and I'm just gonna be saying, hey, right here, you're gonna compare and contrast the chapter that we just read and la, 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 and a record up to 90 seconds. All right, so they're gonna give me a moat symbol. So I can trash this, I can redo it, um, but I'm, and I can play it. I'm just gonna go ahead and insert it for time's sake. It's automatically 
being added to my Google Drive and it's having the same settings as this compare and contrast template. Now, this is boring. All it is, guys, is just the, the oh, come on. Let's see. All it is is just the moat symbol. So instead of using the moat symbol, and of course, I could come in here, I could recolor it, I could make it black and white, I could go ahead and make it red, I could do all of that, or I could do something more fun. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to right click on it, and I'm going to click replace image. And I just happen um, before our conference today, save, I saved my Bitmoji. So I'm going to switch it to my Bitmoji. Then, so now I've got my Bitmoji in there. And my students know, you know, they might not know to click play. Maybe I'm working with those four-year-olds or maybe I'm working with those 11th graders or grade 11 students. So I can go ahead and play it from there or I can go ahead here onto the format options. So do I want to stop the recording on slide change? Let's go ahead and actually, we're going to click here and I want to um, go ahead and open format options again. Um, what's the volume when it's presenting? What size do I want it? Um, and do I want it to loop and play over and over again? And do I want it to play automatically when I get to the slide or on click? Well, let's do automatically and I have 30 seconds and I'm just going to be saying and it goes ahead and works that easily. So a great way to give instructions. It's also a great way for students to submit their work to you with an explanation. Um, super, super simple to use. Go to moat.com or um, go to the Chrome Web Store and search for moat. All right, guys. Um, again, we're not doing any winners. Um, I just want to let you know if you want to contact anybody at Apps Events. Uh, my name is Lisa Nydick, formerly Lisa Thuman. I recently got married. Um, I run North America. Guto is from the UK. Veronica for Manland Europe. Jeans for Asia and the Middle East and the ISTE certification program and the GEG program. And of course, Dan Taylor, our CEO, works with Google Workspace Upgrades and Chrome Enterprise. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Brianna. I had tons and tons of fun with you guys today, and I learned so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the, their evening, their morning, their day. I, for some of you, uh, today's Tuesday in the US. For some of you, it's already Wednesday, <laughs> Wednesday at 2 AM. So thank you. I'm going to end the broadcast. Have a great day.